I would like to invite uh, Ms. Ivy Ganadillo to, to uh, moderate our first panel. Uh, Ivy? All right. Thank you, EG. I hope that everyone could hear me clearly. All right. Uh, again, thank you to Ambassador Chita Santa Romana and Ambassador Wang Xilian for this very good opening session. All right. So I hope that everyone is feeling good this Saturday morning. So anyway, this is the start of our first panel uh, titled Relations with China and the Chinese in History, Science and Education. So we do have here three presenters who will give their um, present their studies on this area. So mm -hmm. our first speaker, uh, let me remind everyone first, um, uh, our speakers will have 20 minutes each to present their papers. I will give you some reminders if it's already 10 minutes, five minutes, and one minute. For our audience, of course, we will do have our open forum later. Okay, just to remind everyone, I, I suggest that you hold on your thoughts. Maybe after the presenter finished their presentation, you could write down and send a chat message for your question after each presentation. Or later on, we will have on the open forum, you could also raise your hand if you do have follow-up questions or more questions that you want to ask with our presenters. All right. So um, without further ado, all right. So let me start this panel. Um, our first presenter is an assistant professor of history at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. So the title of his paper is Los Chinitos, Los Chinos Macanistas, the Cantonese Chinese in the Philippines, 1785 to 1898. So everyone, please welcome Mr. Jelly Galang. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Abby, for that introduction. Uh, thank you for attending our panel. My uh, presentation this morning is entitled, as Ivy said, Los Chinos Macanistas, Cantonese Chinese in the Philippines, 1785 to 1890. When you talk about the Chinese in the Philippines, especially during the Spanish colonial period, you tend to think that the Chinese were a homogenous, uh, monolithic, ethnic and cultural community, which they were, no? but uh, I want to show in this presentation that there are actually, in a sense, two types of Chinese in, in the Philippines from the later part of the 18th century until the end of the Spanish colonial period, and this were the Cantonese Chinese. Uh, in this presentation, uh, I want to explore the Macanista immigration and settlement in the Spanish Philippines. Second, I want to describe and analyze the Spanish colonial state's view of and the policies it imposed upon the Macanistas. And finally, I want to discuss uh, the economic contributions of the Macanistas in the colonial economy. So uh, before the uh, 18th century, uh, Spanish documents would always use the term sanglies or chinos to refer to the Chinese in the Philippines. So you can see on the picture on your uh, right side, uh, it's a detail from the 1763 map of a father, Morillo Velarde. Uh, it says here that, uh, that, that uh, the Chinese were called sanglies or chinos. But this was before the immigration of the Macanistas or the Cantonese Chinese. The main uh, sources I use for this study are materials from the National Archives of the Philippines in Manila, particularly the Chinos bundles. We have more than 100 bundles of uh, the Chinos uh, documents about the Chinese in the Spanish colonial Philippines. Second set of materials are published materials, materials about the Chinese in the Philippines, which were published uh, in, during the second half of uh, the 19th century. So this includes uh, newspapers, uh, books, uh, travel accounts you know, about the Chinese in, in the Philippines. When we talk about uh, the Macanistas or the Macaos as they were referred to in the archival documents, there were two main definitions. The first one, they were 
the Chinese from Macau. So that's uh, this, the, the, the common uh, definition uh, in the archival materials because uh, their point of embarkation was Macau. So they were called Macaus or Macanistas. Uh, the second uh, definition of Macau or Macanistas in the archival documents and other 19th century materials is that there were Cantonese Chinese. Uh, there were some scholars that assert, who assert that uh, Macaus and Macanistas were actually Cantonese Chinese. For instance, Edgar Rickberg would equate Macau and Macanistas as uh, uh, Cantonese Chinese, even Richard Chu. Yeah? Uh, there's one uh, historical, uh, historical geographer, Daniel Deppers, who made a study on uh, the Chinese immigration to the Philippines in the latter part of the 19th century using the Padrones de Chino, so the registers of Chinese uh, residents in the Philippines. And the most common uh, 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 places of origin of this uh, Macaus and Macanistas were Macau or Canton. And so there were two definitions of Macaus and Macanistas. Uh, with regards to Macanista immigration, they came in late, you know, compared with the uh, Hokkien or the Fujian, so the Minanese Chinese, uh, the, the Macanistas or the Cantonese uh, 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 immigrated to the Philippines only in 1785. This was the year when the Spanish colonial government established the Real Compañía de Filipinas or the Royal uh, Philippine Company. Uh, which aimed to establish uh, a direct trading route between the Philippines and Spain. So if we remember, starting 1565, the Philippines had uh, a one-way trading connection with Mexico. No? This was via the Galleon. No? It was called the Galleon, the manila Acapulco trading system. But in the uh, late 18th century, specifically 1785, the Bourbons, the Spanish uh, monarchs, uh, uh, wanted to uh, implement economic reforms, and one of, of the reforms was to establish a direct link, a commercial link between the Philippines and Spain. And in order for the Philippines to transport goods to, to Spain, they had the Philippines had to procure uh, commodities uh, from different parts of, of Asia, but particularly in uh, Canton. So it was the first time that the, the Spanish uh, colonial government allowed uh, ch a Spanish uh, foreign uh, Spanish ships, trading ships, to go to Canton and uh, establish a, a trading relation with with uh, that part of, of China. So uh, uh, Spanish and European commercial ships would uh, come to the Philippines and they would have uh, Cantonese immigrants on board. So that was the first time that uh, we had uh, Cantonese immigrants to the Philippines. However, uh, it is important to know that it was only during the second half of the 19th century that the influx of Cantonese uh, immigration to the Philippines occurred. No? I think it's because of the different um, uh, policies imposed by, uh, by the, by the Spanish colonial government upon the Chinese, particularly, for instance, in 1849, the, the, the Spanish colonial government liberalized uh, the Chinese immigration uh, policy to, uh, to, in the Philippines. Second, uh, in 1852, Macau became the distributive center of the coolie trade in China. So it means that uh, more ships uh, from, uh, uh, from Macau would be uh, coming to, to, to the Philippines. Uh, uh, with uh, Chinese laborers or coolie, uh, coolies uh, on board. And finally, in 1853, there, there was the establishment of the Spanish General Consulate in, in Macau. So this consulate would uh, issue the passports uh, needed for the Cantonese to come to the Philippines. So uh, the bulk of the uh, Cantonese immigration only uh, uh, came to the Philippines during the second half of the 19th century. Uh, we only have uh, approximate or estimates of uh, uh, number of uh, Cantonese to the Philippines during the 
uh, latter part of the Spanish colonial regime. So for instance, according to the report of the Philippine Commission in 1900-1901, this was actually from the interview of the Philippine Commission, the American uh, commissioners with um, Carlos Palanca Tankensian. You know? So Tankensian stated that uh, uh, in 1850s, in the 1850s, there were around 500 Macanistas or Cantonese in the Philippines. After 40 years, uh, there were around 3,000 uh, Cantonese in the entire uh, Philippines, which was uh, equivalent to 5% of the total Chinese population in, in the islands. So we only have estimates of the number. And uh, based on uh, Carlos Palang Kapankenshen's interview, most of the Cantonese were located in, in Manila. Okay? Uh, Manila was the port of landing and the trading, uh, training ground for newly arrived uh, Cantonese immigrants. And interestingly, there were also Chinese, uh, Cantonese Chinese living in Iloilo you know, because they were attracted to the textile industry that was booming uh, in, during the second half of the 19th century in that part of the central Philippines. So it, the exact number and locations of the Macanistas uh, are, are difficult to determine, particularly because of the Spanish colonial states policy on the Chinese, which I will uh, discuss uh, more later. So in this uh, 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 table, you can see uh, uh, this is from Daniel Gepper's study in 1986, uh, 1986 uh, about the origins of Chinese in Manila and the Philippines using uh, Padron, Padrones, the Ch Padrones uh, de Chinos, so Padron General de Chinos, the general registry of all Chinese in the Philippines. Deppers was able to uh, uh, determine the percentage of uh, the Cantonese living in the Philippines, particularly in 18. 94, using the Padron General de Chino. So according to him, uh, those Chinese who wrote Macanton and Macau as their places of origin uh, comprise almost 10% of the total uh, number of Chinese living in Manila in 1894, and about 3.3% uh, uh, in relation to the entire Chinese population in, in 52 provincial centers in the Philippines. So uh, Deppers was the first, I think, uh, scholar who used the Padron General to identify the number, the exact number of Macanistas in the Philippines. But he, but he only he was only able to gather materials for 1894. Uh, Spanish colonial policy on the on the Macanistas, there, there was no distinction made between Chinos or the Hokkien or the Milanese and the Macanistas or the Cantonese. Why the speech dialect affiliations did not matter for the Spanish colonial government, but because for the for the Spaniards, what was important was they would collect taxes from the Chinese. So irrespective of whether a Chinese was Cantonese or Hokkien, it, it doesn't really matter as long as they were paying taxes. So uh, before 18 28, all Chinese, respective of occupation and income, uh, were required to pay uh, the same amount of taxes. But after 1828, all uh, uh, Chinese were classified into four tax uh, categories, depending on the estimated annual income. So basically, the idea is that it doesn't matter whether you're Cantonese or Hokkien, as long as you're paying the tax. Access. Okay. So if the Spanish colonial government had this kind of perspective, you know, uh, uh, where can we find the, the Macanistas, particularly in, in, in relation to uh, their place, places of origin, which is uh, Macau and Canton? You can uh, check, for instance, the Padron General de Chinos, the one that uh, uh, Deppers used uh, for his study in 1986. At the National Archives of the Philippines, we have 450 bundles of this uh, Padron General de Chinos. And no one except uh, Wick Wickberg and uh, Deppers uh, have used this, this bundles. This is a very, uh, very um, uh, 
um, big, uh, very large amount of data that we can we can use you know, uh, between 1786 until 1901. So from the later uh, late 18th century until the early years of the American colonial period, we can also use the Cédula de Capitación Personal uh, or the poll tax certificate. This was established in 1889. So the National Archives also have these uh, materials. We have passports and then the port records and the criminal records. I'll just give some examples. This is the Cédula de Capitación Personal, the Chino. So you can see the, this is the on, on the right side, this is the front page, and then this is the back page, the, the, the one on your left. So you can see here, for instance, Natural de, the one that the circle in, in red. Natural de means, you're, where are you from? Something like that. So it, it, it tells you, the Cédula de Capitación Personal tells you where the Chinese came from. Okay, so this is a very important source of uh, uh, information about the Cantonese. Criminal records, for instance, uh, this uh, document from the National Archives of the Philippines, uh, it's from the Tribunal de Sanglias of the Chinese Court in Binondo, National Archives of the Philippines, Chinos. So this is the first uh, 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 page of the, of the document. So on January 13, 1894, one Chino Macanista. So the, 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 the description of the Chinese was Chino Macanista. So a Macanista Chinese or Cantonese Chinese. Lang Yako Poco was arrested for insolvency. It, this was in Manila. Uh, insolvency meaning he was, he was not able to pay his taxes. So the criminal records uh, were important because uh, uh, the Spanish colonial government would be able to identify uh, the cabecillas or the employers of one particular Chinese who was arrested for, for, for a crime. For instance, Lao Yaku was a macanista uh, who was his employer. So in order for the Spanish colonial government to uh, know how to punish Lang, uh, Lang Yaku and his cabecilla, the information about him and his cabecilla would be uh, stated in the, in the records. Uh, there were also community organizations, Cantonese and uh, Hokkien Hui. You know? uh, these were community organizations uh, that supported uh, newly uh, uh, arrived Cantonese uh, uh, in the Philippines for support and uh, they would provide a residence and employment, particularly in Manila and Iloilo. So according to Wittberg, there were two uh, of this kind of uh, organizations. Uh, we have the Cantonese and uh, we have the Hokkien, Hokkien uh, organization, both in Manila and in Iloilo. Aside from the Spanish colonial government, we also have materials from journalists and foreign travelers. You know, for instance, we have the, the journalist Rafael de Comenge. According to him in 1894, not all Chinese, this is already a translation from the original Spanish, not all Chinese are the same, although they seem so from their physical attributes. Some are Chinos and others are Macaos. And these two descriptions have great importance in the Philippines. Neither Macau wants to be Chino, nor Chino Macau. So uh, if we cannot get uh, adequate materials from the Spanish materials, particularly the, the, in relation to the number and the residence, we can uh, uh, get uh, material uh, information from journalists and foreign travelers during the second half of the 19th century. Uh, this people would also uh, describe, for instance, uh, that Macanistas had uh, specialization in different occupations. They were uh, known to be the best shoemakers, cabinet makers, and others. From the uh, archival documents, I was able to uh, get materials, uh, details about uh, Macanista carpenters. Uh, there was one Spanish company, the Aldecoa y Compañía, in the second half of the 19th century, who had abaca or uh, hemp, Amandila hemp plantations in northern Mindanao and uh, summer Leyte area in the 1890s. And uh, this Spanish company preferred employing Cantonese carpenters because from their perspective, the Cantonese carpenters were the best carpenters. So in this uh, document, you can see 
a, a list of Cantonese Chinese who were uh, employed in the uh, Abaca plantations of the uh, Aldecoe Company in Oroqueta, Misamis, Northern Mindanao in 1894. I was also able to get uh, documents about uh, Macanista miners. So aside from uh, carpenters, they were also uh, viewed as uh, good miners, the best miners. In Southeast Asia, usually the best miners, the best Chinese miners were usually uh, the Hakka miners. If you look at uh, the history of Chinese in Indonesia, Malaysia, for instance, the Hakka miners were uh, the most preferred uh, laborers. But in the Philippines, I was able to uh, gather materials about Macanista miners. Uh, this was, uh, they were employed by the Cantabro Filipino company. It's also a Spanish company. Uh, the most successful of all other mining spe speculations undertaken on large scale in the colony, according to the British uh, John Foreman in 1899. So this uh, Macanista miners were employed in the copper mine mines in Lepanto in Northern Luzon from 1856 yeah, to 1898. So aside from Filipino laborers, the Cantonese miners also played a significant role in the mining of copper. Okay, And finally, I was able to uh, uh, obtain materials about Macanista cooks and uh, Panciteros. You know? From the materials, uh, from the archival materials, uh, they, 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 they claim that to have a cook, at least during the latter part of the 19th century, to have a Chinese, uh, Cantonese Chinese cook was a status symbol. So there was one uh, Cantonese Chinese in Ilo in 1887, Atong, the name was Atong. Uh, he, uh, a lot of uh, uh, merchants, Chinese merchants, Chinese businesses, and Spanish merchants wanted to employ him as, 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 a, as a cook to, to serve them uh, when they have uh, uh, fiestas in uh, other gatherings. No? There were also Cantonese restaurants in, in Manila. And one of the best known uh, 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 restaurant is the Pansateria Macanista de Buen Gusto in in the number, which was also uh, discussed or mentioned by Rizal in his novel uh, In 1909, uh, the Bureau of Agriculture stated that there was a, a kind of noodle, the bihon noodle, uh, uh, which was made from glutinous rice called macanista. So the Bureau of Agriculture, this was during the American colonial period, uh, uh, state that, stated that uh, uh, there were uh, there was one particular rice variety used by Cantonese restaurants to, to make bihon, that, that the rice was called macanista. In conclusion, there were two types of Chinese in the Spanish colony in the Philippines. You have the Hokkien and the Cantonese called Macau and Macanistas. Macanista immigration occurred in the late 18th century, but the influx of, of Cantonese happened only during the second half of the 19th century. It is challenging, however, not impossible to determine the number and locations of Macanistas because of colonial policies related to the Chinese. And finally, Macanistas played a very important role in the colonial economy. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Jelly Galang. All right. So, um, it's always inspiring to hear uh, Dr. Jelly Galang present his studies on China's history. I mean, this kind of research is actually very challenging. Uh, and there are very few scholars in the Philippines that are actually looking at the rich history of Chinese in the Philippines. So I hope that... Uh, graduate students here or our students here, undergraduate students will be inspired also with the works of uh, Dr. Jelly Galang on this area of China studies. So it, it shows us that of course Chinese immigration in the Philippines, it's, it's not something new, it rooted back like those early, early years in the Philippines. And it shaped what the history, the culture of the Filipinos that we do have right now. So anyway, um, I know you do have some thoughts and questions or maybe comments and you want to clarify later on with Dr. Jelly on his presentation. So you could chat it right now uh, so that we could summarize it later on. But anyway, uh, hold it uh, for later because we will have an open forum for that. So we will move on next to for our next presenter. So from history, now we will talk about science. 
uh, in relation to China studies, of course. So our presenter is uh, Kay Principe, a senior science research specialist at the Philippine Council for Agriculture, Aquatic and Natural Resources Research and Development of the Departments of Science and Technology. So she is also a graduate student at the UP Asian Center pursuing master's degree in Asian studies. So her type, uh, research title here now on the screen is Science in Stride, the Philippines-China Science and Technology Cooperation on Agricultural Research and Development. All right, let's listen to Kay. So thank you, Ms. Ivy Ganadillo, for the introduction. Daja uh, hao, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Good morning to our distinguished guest, uh, officers of the Board of Directors, um, Advisory Board, fellows and members of the Philippine Association for Chinese Studies, fellow presenters and participants. Uh, again, thank you to uh, the Philippine Association for Chinese Studies and the committee leading this event or conference for um, this opportunity to share with you ongoing research that in general highlights the potential of potentials and challenges of strengthening the relationship between the Philippines and China. Specifically, uh, Science in Stride, the Philippines-China Science and Technology Cooperation on Agricultural Research and Development examines the relationship of the two countries in such a context and argues how SNT collaboration or cooperation um, is or can be a sustainable and strategic diplomatic path in maintaining that relationship despite difficult or challenging periods. So we are still under a global health crisis that is felt across nations um, and borders. Issues and challenges of um, our time, such as poverty and inequality, health, environmental degradation, climate change, food security, among others, um, these have been persisting. The pandemic magnified how the challenges we face today are significantly, evidently, globally interconnected. Now, these challenges transcend geopolitical borders. Science as a field and um, the science, technology, and innovation continuum um, can be complex, but it offers solutions to these pressing challenges. It allows us to understand our, our, understand our limitations and capabilities as um, an individual, as a society, and in turn, the governments can strategically respond to these various uh, global issues. In the past decades, scholars have advocated for societies and scientific communities to work towards um, what we call good and better science, um, referring to it as a human endeavor that seeks to make STI work for, for all. So, of course, STI is not um, the ultimate solution for all of the world's problem, but it is considered and practiced as an avenue for collaboration and cooperation in the international community. Now, science, due to its universality and ideally a political nature, is one key avenue to address various global challenges. Many countries have been cooperating continuously over the past decades, grounded on science because of its role as an equalizing field to level of opportunities for development. Um, however, it can be observed that there are two expressions um, when we talk of the potentials of science. Um, one, there are cases where potentials are not maximized. Um, countries have yet to include the need for scientific and technical investments or initiatives in their respective national development plans. Um, the International Food Policy Research Institute in 2021 noted that many developing countries uh, still do not include a strong SDI strategy in their development plans. Um, on the other hand, um, it also occasionally um, becomes a source of conflict. Uh, technological innovations, as many analysts believed, and as you may be aware, uh, were at the core of the recent US-China trade dispute. So focusing on the Philippines and China, despite the many differences between the two countries, um, be it demographic, size, economy, um, development history, and trajectory, etc. It can be observed that both countries value science, technology, and innovation. It has been translated into an encompassing policy um, and as a na national strategy, um, identified as a key government intervention to support um, scientific discoveries, um, innovations, um, and strengthen global competitiveness. 
um, Sener and Saridogan in 2011 attested this to their multi-year research, concluding that high-ranking countries in um, the Global Competitiveness Index, or GCI, um, countries such as Germany, uh, South Korea, Japan, and recent players such as China and India are very STI-oriented. These countries have national global competitiveness strategies, which in turn contribute to sustainable long-run growth. Now, based on that, index are the, the GCI, China is consistently high or among the high ranking countries. So it is not just the economy that is changing or has changed dramatically in China um, that has contributed to the increase in R&D investments of the country, but there seems to be a radical transformation happening in the field of science and technology. President Xi Jinping had, uh, has positioned um, science-based innovation at the top of the national agenda. And this is consistently articulated in their five-year development plans. Um, investments in research, according to the OECD main science and technology indicators, have remained consistently high. China's investment, um, although more dominantly driven by um, R&D activities financed by businesses, averaged to about 320 billion US dollars from 2009 to 2018. In 2015, when China launched its uh, Made in China 2025 campaign, it signaled a shift uh, to increasing government and higher education-led innovations. On the other hand, um, the Philippines continuously improved through the years, and this is manifested uh, or manifesting that commitment to leverage SDI for national development. We are improving our rankings based on the World Competitiveness Index, um, global innovation measures, and most recently as published in a national survey by the Department of Science and Technology in 2021, we have had significant investments in human and financial resources supporting research and development from 2015 to 2018 meaning um, more Filipinos, whether personnel or scientists and researchers, are engaged in R&D. Likewise, our R&D expenditure grew by 269% uh, during the period of 2015 to 2018. That's about 21.8 billion Philippine peso. So um, just to show you, as published by the Center for Strategic and International Studies of China, showed us the increase in R&D investments that is now second to that of the U.S., for the Philippines, for the Philippines, we again made significant improvements based on, on various measures over the past years, as shown in the report published by the Department of Science and Technology. So against this backdrop, we see both countries on the same page when it comes to SDI as a uh, included in the national development agenda. Um, it is considered as one of the key drivers of growth and development. Um, it is supported with institutional and organizational changes that boost the production of knowledge, of know-how, tools, and methods. It improves productivity, it improves competitiveness, and overall supports faster growth. Um, now, in the paper, I argue and um, I think advocated for science diplomacy, specifically in agricultural R&D, as a strategic and sustainable path in nurturing the relationship between the Philippines and China. In the interest of, um, say, establishing a long-term and sustainable partnership between institutions from the Philippines and China to further enhance cooperation on STI, uh, science diplomacy through agricultural R&D provides a path continuously open as a venue for engagement, um, it can also be used as a tool for decision makers to strengthen the partnership between the two countries. Now, science diplomacy can be uh, viewed as a formalized set of operations practiced by governments and, and also as a field of study. I included a section on its definition, descriptions, and explorations in the literature reviewed because I wanted to establish it um, um, or the relevance of it in the in the research. So this is to address also the research gap on um, the national styles of science diplomacy. Um, most literature on this subject refers to science diplomacy approaches from the Western perspective, notably for countries um, such as in Europe, um, the US and Australia. Um, in Asia, it can be noted that science diplomacy has not been fully realized. It is rather defined loosely 
in the context of um, scientific partnerships and collaboration instead of as a holistic um, concept and tool for diplomacy or as embedded in national foreign policies. There is also an observed gap in the literature on studies on, for example, science diplomats um, in the context of Asia. Um, for Western countries, um, officials with specific roles for science diplomacy are well-defined, albeit um, limited to, for example, scientific attaches and dignitaries or scientists and technocrats, te technocrats tapped to represent the state. Um, in, is, in Asia, this role is delegated to foreign ministers or representatives. Um, in the Philippines, it is an assumed role by the Secretary of uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Department of Science and Technology, the Department of Agriculture, or other officials performing such a function. So um, there's also a gap in literature on studies analyzing the needs, roles, and responsibilities of science diplomats. So to oper operationalize science diplomacy in the research, here are some of the ideas from, from the literature. Um, it is the use of scientific collaborations among nations to address the challenges of the day with emphasis on building and strengthening constructive and mutually beneficial partnerships. It captures the role of science in foreign policy, partnerships that are or that can be sustained and fostered regardless of political background, environments, and winds. Um, lastly, it is not exclusive to major powers. Uh, most states um, engaging in science diplomacy forge agreements on scientific and technological cooperation as its first step. Um, opening communication and dialogue for mutual exchanges of scientific information and breakthroughs and engaging in activities to strengthen their institutions and human resources. So um, I emphasize the last point because um, this succinctly captures the manner in which we engage and practice science diplomacy. So um, while science diplomacy has perceived benefits, it also has its limitations. In the case studies that were reviewed, uh, there were questions on, for example, what constitutes true partnership and collaboration? Is it really mutually beneficial? Um, how do we measure its success, the impacts or outcomes? Also, while science ideally, again, aims to be apolitical, um, politics remains to be influential in any scientific pursuit, as some of the literature has um, suggested. So with the main thesis on um, science diplomacy in, inter in agricultural R&D as a strategic and sustainable path of engagement for the Philippines and China, I have two particular arguments. Uh, first, there are important institutional paths that leverage science diplomacy as observed today. Um, the foreign policy of um, the Duterte administration, the leadership and direction of the national line agencies uh, directly involved, and the role of the research and development institutions and academia that prove crucial in the process. Um, second, agricultural R&D provided the means and the venue for continuous engagement um, and cooperation despite the difficult periods um, in the history of the Philippines and China relationship. So I ground um, the discussion on the, um, what you call this, the renewed memorandum of understanding on S&D cooperation between the Philippines um, DOST and China's Ministry of Science and Technology, specifically on cooperation areas for the agriculture research sector. Um, this was signed on August 29, uh, 2019, and was included in the six bilateral agreements between the Philippines and China after President Duterte's um, state visit to Beijing. So I included um, also a brief review of the diplomatic ties between the two countries. Um, Ambassador Santa Romana has you know, um, um, uh, shared this um, during the opening program. So uh, noting the accomplishments and challenges from the first um, agreement on scientific and technological cooperation that was established in um, around 1978. Um, and also the status of current agreements um, and activities both countries are pursuing um, that is on renewable energy, agriculture, and health. So to validate, I'm continuously engaging with the literature um, that includes um, official documents and sources, um, um, published materials, newspapers, uh, newspaper clippings. So um, with the quarantine restrictions also gradually easing, um, 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 I'm for, uh, I look forward to proceeding with uh, select, uh, conducting my select key informant interviews 
of um, program and project leaders that would shed light on the process of collaborating with their Chinese counterparts on agricultural R&D. Um, and um, also to balance that, um, to get insights from Chinese researchers and research managers, either through email or virtual interviews. So uh, briefly, um, initial research results highlight the essential role of partnerships and collaborations under the global context. The Philippines, uh, for the Philippines, uh, this cooperation agreement signal its commitment to harness and further enhance bilateral relationship with China. Uh, to this end, international scientific collaboration is highly encouraged across agencies in the Philippines, including um, the provision of necessary support given to both Filipino and Chinese scientists working together within this partnership mechanisms. So in the country, um, again, the DFA, the USD, and the DA were just some of the national agencies identified as those practicing science diplomacy um, with regards to their engagement with um, China. International collaboration in um, agricultural R&D strengthens the capacities of local researchers by providing them uh, the opportunities to utilize pooled resources from the collaboration. Uh, this includes facilities and expertise from their counterparts. Um, examples are um, establish um, and proposals to build R&D facilities such as laboratories that will host joint R&D activities. It also enables them to contribute and build on ideas, generating new knowledge for a broader audience and with wider um, application. For example, uh, the Philippines, uh, the USD, and China's MOS launched in last year in 2021 eight joint research and development projects under its joint research program. So these are parallel research um, that will be implemented for about two years with an annual fund of about 8 million pesos for the Philippine side and about 1 million RMB for the Chinese side. So there are also direct benefits for the Filipino farmers uh, participating in this partnership from, um, from this partnership with China. Um, a specific case I mentioned um, um, includes the accomplishments of the Philippine Sino Center for Agricultural Technology or FILCICAT, wherein the cooperation centered on quality hybrid um, rice varieties, um, highlighting the enduring legacy of Professor Yuan Longping. Um, they also showcase advanced and practical agro machinery and um, training and promotion of agricultural technologies. Um, in terms of the challenges, um, initial thematic areas for discussion will tackle how this focus on science diplomacy in agricultural R&D dealt with changing foreign policies. Um, there are also, uh, or I also anticipate, you know, questions on trust and uh, on mutually beneficial, on, or the question on mutually beneficial cooperation, the idea or the concept of that, and dealing with a non-traditional partner such as China. So the key informant interviews uh, will help enrich um, insights on these challenges. So um, to end the presentation, hopefully I was able to share with you how um, science diplomacy focusing on agricultural R&D offers a renewed path in strengthening the relationship between the Philippines and China. While we have yet to see um, the accomplishments of this revitalized scientific agreements and initiatives, or how scientific collaboration and cooperation will endure the occasional challenges within our relationships with China, um, nevertheless, science and technology remain an open, viable avenue for continuous exchange, people-to-people uh, -people links, and diplomacy. So thank you for your attention. I am pleased to share with you my email in case you want to reach out with your questions and feedback. Again, thank you to, uh, to PAX, led by its president, Dr. Romel Banlawi, and the board of directors for this opportunity to, to share our research at this conference in celebration of the association's um, founding anniversary. Thank you as well to uh, Dr. Tina Calamente uh, for her encouragement to share our research through this event or platform. So magandang araw po. All right. Thank you very much, Kay. This is actually very insightful. I made a lot of notes while you are presenting. Uh, science diplomacy. So I think uh, not everyone is familiar with this one. And this is another area that Philippines could actually um, 
explore and our scholars actually could explore as well. So as you can see here that there are a lot of areas of cooperation and opportunities that are actually overlapping. And I think, uh, of course, China right now wants to champion in sustainable development goals, climate change. So you can see that there are a lot of things that we could explore and look more on these relations. So uh, I, I acknowledge as well, I, I really appreciate that you said about the challenges. Yeah, politics, foreign policy, this actually shapes a lot on how we deal with our relations, even like scientists always say that maybe scientists should talk to each other and we could some, do something more productive. But of course, politics always comes in the way. But anyway, we will talk more about it later. And yeah, Kay, I encourage you to share this more in different forums. Uh, it's really nice. So if you do have questions uh, later, I hope that uh, you could have something to share as well with Kay about this one. You have additional insights. Please chat, message it on the chat box or later on in the open forum. Please bring it up. All right. So moving on um, from science, from history, science, now we will move to education. So our third speaker, all right, is... Um, our uh, third speaker is Ms. Uh, Dr. Joseph Ching Velasco, an associate professor, professorial lecturer at the Department of Political Science and Development Studies of De La Salle University, Manila. So the title of his presentation now on the uh, screen right now, International Student Mobility and Sino-ASEAN Relations, Examining the Intersection of Soft Power and Education. All right, Joseph? Okay, thank you, Ivy, um, for the introduction. And I also acknowledge um, the officers and committees of um, and the committees of PACS for holding this event. So the title of my presentation is International Student Mobility and Sino-ASEAN Relations, Examining the Intersections of Soft Power and Education. So first, um, China has become a competitive player in the global higher education landscape with a growing number of Chinese universities being part of the um, global rankings. And with a significant improvement in the quality of um, some Chinese universities, education as a soft power um, is being deployed by China towards some ASEAN countries. And this strategy was particularly evident in the Ministry of Education's appeal to um, Chinese universities to serve the nation's diplomatic strategies. So in this presentation, I further elucidate on China's projection of soft power to Southeast Asian states, um, particularly through education. Um, for this presentation, um, I will start with a discussion on the globalization of education, followed by student mobility outflows in Southeast Asia and the rising importance of global university rankings. Then I will move to the delineation between hard power and soft power. And I would proceed to unpack how China uses education as a soft power, particularly through its university. Um, and lastly, I will highlight China's education policies and elucidate on its recent policy, particularly in um, improving its higher education quality. So there has been a shift in the outflows of students in Asia, specifically in the context of higher education. Um, in Asia, most international students outflows are projected towards universities in developed countries, primarily in the West. And the reason for this motivation of students in preferring North American and European universities was um, partly precipitated by the need to strengthen knowledge transfer, um, national capacity building, and um, the thrust for modernization. Um, countries such as India, China, South Korea, and Malaysia have been strongly involved in this form of student mobility. However, this trend is gradually being disrupted as some universities in Asia have actively maintained a globally competitive profile, thus attracting students within the region. And um, this phenomenon stems from the influence of globalization in the realm of higher education. Um, Giddens argues that globalization is the intensification of worldwide social relations, while which link distant localities in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring um, many miles away and vice versa. And in a similar vein, um, Dreher et al. illumine that globalization is the intensification of cross-national interactions that promote the establishment of transnational structures and the global integration of cultural, economic, and environmental, political, technological, and social processes on a global, supranational, regional, and local levels. So therefore, this um, fosters a form of worldwide interconnectedness, um, encouraged by flows and movement, encouraged by flows and movements of um, language, ideas, technologies, people, and um, even finance in real time. 
So it can be perceived as a trend that points toward a world system and one worldness. And despite being framed for the most part on the macro level, um, globalization does have a considerable effect on the regional level and subsequently in the field of education. For example, it paved the way for the formation of organizations such as um, um, the ASEAN University Network or the European Higher Education Area. It also facilitated a competitive race among universities to reach certain performance metrics, which is then um, ranked in ranked by various agencies, such as um, the Times Higher Education World University Rankings or the QS World University Rankings. Um, and globalization tilts the power relations among nations, even in the area of education. Um, in essence, it has a great impact on universities, which are um, among the most globally sensitive of all human institutions. And Marginson further argues that in, high, in higher education and other spheres, um, it is marked by the growing role of the global dimensions of actions, including global spaces, systems, agencies, and products, and by the impact of global systems and phenomena in local and in national affairs. Sometimes the global pushes aside the local and national dimensions, and sometimes it does not, so that the global coexists with the local and national and seeps into the daily life and ordinary um, common sense. So in the Asian context, such a movement forced higher education systems to um, rethink the way they operate and receive and reconceive their um, position in the global system of knowledge production. Um, as an example, um, Collins et al. 2014 revealed that Singapore's public universities were in a way corporatized um, and specifically higher education institutions were assumed to transform themselves into entities that are um, entrepreneurial and align their practice with industries that are knowledge based. Um, consequently, universities were also expected to produce a significant amount of research um, and improve global reputation and, of course, invite foreign talent. And universities in East Asia faced some, cha faced some changes in responding to globalization. This includes um, improving research output and moving up in the global university rankings. Um, and some universities um, in developing countries have considerably drawn nearer to their ideally envisioned institutions as situated in the global context. Um, consequently, the original trajectory of student mobility from East to West is now changing through the regional dynamics around international mobility um, as more students begin to move within Asia and Asian countries become host to international students. So simply put, um, new patterns of mobility have emerged in Asia due to the emerging socioeconomic developments in the region. Um, countries such as Malaysia, Singapore, China have shifted from an, an exporter of um, mobile students to an emerging importer. So it is also quite apparent that student mobility in Asia manifested noticeable changes in how um, universities operate, revealing, revealing new strategies um, rationalities and motivations in the area of education vis-a-vis -vis, um, globalization. And unlike in the previous decades, the focus on the West for international education is gradually being reshaped with the inclusion of emerging players um, through countries such as China and Singapore. So as a case in point, um, in 2009, um, the combined scientific paper output from China, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and Singapore accounts for 80% of the total number of American output. Um, however, um, more recently, China has outranked the United States in terms of scientific publication quantity. Um, Hallinger illumines that high profile competition among institutions of higher learning drives interest in global university rankings and research productivity is one of the key metrics in rank improvement. So um, the increasing competitiveness of universities in Asia has become a potent pull factor to attract international students. And due to the changes made by certain universities in Asia to improve their operations in terms of um, teaching, research, and student recruitment, um, the race to be part on top of the global rankings, or at least regional ranking, has disturbed the status quo. And notably, as you can see on the slide, um, China has been one of the countries that send a great number of students to universities to other countries. So in 2013, um, there is roughly around... Um, 
400,000 students, 400,000 students abroad. But with the most recent figures or most recent estimates, they're at approximately 700,000 Chinese students abroad. Um, and despite being a top sending country for international students, China has also started to absorb quite a number of international students. Um, and this signals that um, there's an interest in, uh, this signals that China has um, this growing interest for the international student recruitment in, in or market in Asia. Uh, major destinations for ASEAN students who seek international education um, go to the US, UK, and increasingly China. This is further exemplified by China's growing foreign student enrollment. Um, China in 2015 has accounted for approximately 8% of the international student market, which is ranked third for international college student intake after the US and the UK. And as a um, strong emerging competitor in the international higher education market, China is using its position to recalibrate its relationship with neighboring countries. And essentially, um, it, they are using education as a form of soft power. Uh, so in, simply put, um, hard power is defined as the capacity to get countries to um, get what they want through the use of economic power or military force. And um, conversely, soft power is the ability to co obtain desired outcomes um, through attraction rather than coercion or um, even payment. So as defined by Nye 2004, um, soft power is the ability to influence through persuasion. And primarily, a um, soft power arises from the attractiveness of a country's um, culture, political ideals, and policies. Um, and according to the Chinese Ministry of Education, um, the scholarships offered by China paved the way for the growth in the number of international students in the country. Um, in 2017, for example, China granted scholarships to approximately 58,000 students from um, um, uh, 180 countries. So China is at attempting to project itself globally through education and culture. And um, its global influence is further projected through educational exchange and collaboration, which is evident in the ASEAN region. Um, Chinese leaders are aware of the need to sustain this contact with ASEAN countries. And one effective way is through um, the, the dramatic expansion of, of Confucius Institutes in the region. And this strategy is effectively summarized by the statement of the ASEAN China Center Secretary General Yang Xiuping that foreign students from Southeast Asian countries are the bridge and future of the relationship between ASEAN and China. And we want to see more exchange students from ASEAN countries in China. Um, in China. So therefore, the ASEAN region is seen um, as an emerging market for student recruitment with its noticeable um, economic growth. And um, Zigress 2017 estimates that there are at least 250 ASEAN students completing degrees outside their home country with China and Singapore as likely destinations. Um, and with deeper integration in the ASEAN region, um, Chan, Chan 2012 argues that there will be more outflows of students in the region as they are searching for better educational um, opportunities and experiences. And given that China is one of the dialogue um, partners of ASEAN and is, and is increasingly becoming influential in the region, um, I examined some manifestations of um, soft power, particularly in people-to-people -people exchange. And um, I also highlight the Chinese overseas institutional partnerships within ASEAN countries. And I note it as an, an interrelated exercise of soft power. So just, a few, uh, just to show a few figures, um, in 2020, the total public spending on college and university education in China amounted to approximately 1.4 trillion yuan. Um, compared to the previous year, spending grew by around 4%. And the public spending for, uh, for um, each student in tertiary education in China amounted to an approximate um, 37,000 yuan in 2020. And um, for the budget plan for 2021, or for the 2021 budget of the leading universities in China, um, it is revealed that Tsinghua University in Beijing anticipated the largest budget for that year of all universities in China. And the budget plan for Tsinghua University for 2021 amounted to around um, approximately 31 billion yuan. And for that particular year, at least 34 universities in China had budget planned above 5 billion yuan. 
And this figure shows the trend of the number of ASEAN students who studied in China for more than six months. Uh, more likely, these are individuals who are completing degree programs from universities in China. And as shown in the figure, Thailand has one of the biggest contingent of students in China, and it seems to be in a continuing upward trend. Um, so ASEAN and China sees the opportunity to improve relations through improved people-to-people -people exchange. And um, I note the term of Welch 2018 um, called muscular diplomacy, which is highly relevant in the framing of this issue and is, and is seemingly in contravention of, from the exercise of diplomacy and soft power. Um, China's use of muscular di diplomacy is detrimental to its image in the ASEAN region. Its forceful and unilateral approach to diplomacy um, sows discontent and distress from the ASEAN bloc. However, this sense of distrust from ASEAN is gradually being mended through acts of goodwill, um, specifically through educational cooperation and exchange, and more recently, vaccine diplomacy. Um, China's education ministry is cognizant of this strategy, as I've said earlier, um, to quote the Ministry of Education, uh, or the yeah, um, Chinese Ministry of Education even appealed to the nation's university to serve the nation's diplomatic strategies. And China also extended its educational presence in countries such as Laos, uh, Malaysia, and Thailand. In the case of Malaysia, Siam University op opened a campus in the country. And the case for Laos is similar to Malaysia when it allowed a Chinese university to operate in the country. Specifically, Suzhou University was allowed to operate by Vientiane. And in Thailand, there is also cooperation um, in this aspect. Um, the Bangkok Business School of Yunnan University of Finance and Economics in cooperation of, with Rangsit University was um, conceptualized. And based on these transnational institutional developments between China and ASEAN, it can be deduced that China seeks to be an active participant in the, in the educational systems of um, some ASEAN countries. And um, Wu 2019 argues that the internationalization initiatives of China in higher education is an instrument in improving its global reputation. So it seems obvious that Chinese it is it seems obvious that the Chinese government is promoting higher education internationalization as an important initiative due to its increasing awareness of the strategic position of higher education in international relations. So there are three major dimensions of Chinese um, outward-oriented higher education internationalization approach. This includes, um, of course, the Confucius Institute programs and um, international development aid in higher education and, um, of course, um, student recruitment for um, education. So these are, these are regarded as instruments that may enhance its um, impacts and status in the world knowledge system. So overall, this model of setting up campuses abroad also has been a strategy of other countries. So it's not solely um, a Chinese strategy. So in this table, um, China's five-year plan in relation to its education policy is shown. Um, China's five-year plan, which is, I think, more formally known as five-year plan for national economic and social development, show how the state seeks to progress through different forms of um, development initiatives. Um, Wu traced several five-year plans of China, specifically charting the course of Chinese higher education. So this table shows China's landmark policies on higher education from 1991 um, up to the present. And as can be seen as, um, as early as three decades ago, um, China has prepared to reform its educational system to be more outward looking. In, um, and in 2016 to 2020 five-year plan, the higher education system plays a key role in the Belt and Road initi Initiative. Um, furthermore, um, the 2021 to 2021 five-year plan highlights the role of universities in China um, role of universities in China's strategic goal by strengthening its um, world-class university and world-class disciplines um, initiative, um, which is abbreviated to um, double world-class or the Shuang Yilio. Um, and the, with the double world-class initiative, some leading Chinese universities have been positioned to compete with other top-ranked research-intensive universities from other countries. And this motivation to, com to globally compete stems from the country's economic um, growth in the past decade, and such is closely related to the, um, the aspiration of Chinese universities to perform similar to the leading U.S. research universities. So ultimately, the Chinese government has set a target for its 42 universities to be included in the global rankings by 2050. So just to um, conclude, um, 
Uh, overall, China is an emerging country for hosting international education, and ASEAN countries are also emerging markets for um, seeking international education. And the interface of the two phenomena opens spaces for further discussion, specifically in the area of student mobility. And given that Chinese, Chinese universities are positioning themselves as a competitor, China has a valuable tool in improving relations with ASEAN countries. Um, and China can enhance their position in Southeast Asia through its continuous show of goodwill, more specifically by taking more students from ASEAN region and or by intensifying their initiatives to operate offshore campuses in um, offshore campuses of Chinese universities. So um, thank you. That concludes my presentation. All right. Thank you, Dr. Velasco. Thank you, Joseph, for this very interesting presentation. Right. So I think this is another opportunity that we Filipinos actually could grab into. Um, I think not so many Filipinos are, are aware and, and like other countries about the educational opportunities that China is actually giving and presenting. Uh, if you could check the uh, uh, Pax, Facebook, Twitter, I think we have uh, recently announced some um, scholarships from the ASEAN University uh, Network. It's um, ASEAN China Scholarship. But aside from that, of course, China has its own uh, Chinese government scholarship. So I think it's open for September uh, in uh, for the fall semester. So we could take and grab that opportunity. And I think from the presentation of Joseph, you can see that the Philippines is a little bit lagging behind in numbers for those students who are grabbing the opportunity to study in China. So I think. For those students who want to study about like history, science, and technology, I think this is a very good opportunity for us to grab and go to China, understand China more, learn more about China. Of course, why? In order for us to help the Philippines and gain those knowledge on how are we going to have to craft our own foreign policy relations more with China and how to improve as well different aspects or areas and uh, in different um, fields in the Philippines. If China's good in R&D, I mean, maybe we could learn more about it. If it's good in business, we could learn more about it. So there are different things that we could, um, there are different opportunities that we could grab here on this. So anyway, guys, so uh, we do have very interesting three um, presentations this morning. We will do have more presentations later this afternoon and in the next Saturdays of this month. So I hope that you will all attend this one. So anyway, um, our chat box, of course, is open again for questions to our presenters if you do want to further clarify and um, confirm or uh, wants to ask any kind of questions in relation to their presentation. All right, so I, we do have enough time for open forums, so you could also raise your hands for this one. But anyway, uh, while you are thinking or typing your questions, uh, we do receive some questions here, but uh, maybe I could go on since our first presenter is Jelly. Um, uh, uh, Jerry, you talk about um, the history of, of, of Chinese in the Philippines. I know that you have different subjects. Uh, you're really working on this field uh, for your PhD studies and now are still continuing it. So um, I think it's like what I've mentioned earlier, it's quite challenging to dig really the Chinese history. I mean, uh, different aspects of history in the Philippines, especially the Chinese history in the Philippines. So. Uh, just inspire also our young scholars here. I mean, what inspires you to research on the Chinese history in the Philippines? And again, what is the main challenge as a scholar, as a, yeah, on digging uh, Chinese history in the Philippines? Yeah, thank you so much, Ivy. Uh, it was actually Dean Eileen Baviera mm. who inspired me to do Chinese studies. So, it was, I think, in 2007 or 2008 that I was, she, she chose me as one of the two representatives from the Philippines to the East West Center's uh, 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 China Institute, Summer Institute, that was a one month uh, institute in, in Hawaii. Uh, so, uh, Dean Baviera was the main. Uh, inspiration for, for my study of the Chinese in the Philippines. Although, of course, she wanted me to, to work on China, I mean, uh, Philippines-China relations, but I am a student of history. That's one. So second, I 
uh, I cannot read Chinese. So if you want to write something about China, I think it's a must that you know how to read uh, and read and uh, speak Chinese. No? So uh, I, I told her that I'll be focusing on the history of the Chinese in the Philippines. And my background is uh, history. So I'll focus on the Spanish colonial period. So that's the reason why my PhD dissertation and the my, my current research is on the Chinese the history of the Chinese in the Philippines. Uh, uh, not many people are doing this type of research, so I think uh, it's it's my small way of contributing to the to the to the literature. Uh, the main challenges I think is that, of course, you have to be patient. Uh, because uh, doing history is really uh, going to the archives, getting materials, uh, transcribing the materials. In my case, I am using Spanish sources because uh, I'm focusing on the Spanish colonial period, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. So you have to know how, to, you have to be patient in, in doing archival research. You have to learn how to read um, uh, Spanish. Uh, I can read Spanish, although I cannot speak Spanish very fluently. Uh, um, and I think it's also good, for instance, that uh, to have uh, 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 like uh, financial support from your institutions. Like if you really want to do an in-depth study of, of the, the Chinese history of the Chinese in the Philippines, it's also important that you go to other uh, archives, not only in the Philippines, although in the Philippines we have good uh, uh, archival materials uh, in our national archives, no? but we can also go to Spain and Mexico to get additional uh, uh, materials. So I encourage everyone to <laughs> to uh, join me in my in our in our quest to dig more materials and uh, read these materials and enrich our understanding of the Chinese in the Philippines the history of the Chinese in the Philippines. Thank you. Yeah. All right, since you have started, Jelly, we do have for your um, one more question. Uh, huh, as a scholar of historical studies on the Chinese in the Philippines, what would you tell the layman regarding the salience of your work in contemporary discourse? I think this is a cliche, but in order for us to really understand the contemporary period, we have to know the past. I mean, in order for us, for instance, if we talk about uh, racism during the pandemic, especially in, in, in the Philippines at the moment, uh, we always focus on, of course, uh, the, the contemporary relations between China and, and the Philippines. But I think it's also important we have a broader historical view of what is happening. For instance, it's important to highlight that uh, in the Philippines, there are two types of Chinese. You have the Chinese citizens from, from uh, the Republic, uh, the uh, People's Republic of China, and then you have the Chinois. And the, the Chinois have been here since the Spanish colonial period. So I think that's uh, the contribution of uh, students of history like me to, to give a, a broader picture of what is happening now. Because what's happening now is uh, a product or partly a product of what happened in the past. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, you know. mm -hmm. I really agree with that uh, with that uh, answer of Jelly because me myself in my master's thesis I studied uh, Ch Chinese migration in the Philippines and I really need to dig on the history uh, of Chinese migration in the Philippines. So uh, this is really helpful in order for us to understand what is happening right now. It's not just, it just started because of the current status right now in the Philippines, but it goes back to our history and there's a long history between Philippines and China. All right, so moving on. So guys, you could still send your um, questions later on. Jelly could still answer other questions or you could send any questions to our presenters or raise your hand as well. So anyway, we do have several questions for Kay. Uh, let me read the first one. One of the key factors of know-how exchange between nations and therefore the development of science and diplomacy is the protection of intellectual property. So given that China does not have an advanced legal IP protection system, in what extent can this factor be a challenge uh, in science cooperation between China and the Philippines? 
Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Mateo, for the question. And um, I agree, um, it is a consideration, a challenging factor. But if we review the scientific co cooperation agreements that we have now, um, these agreements have well articulated IP clauses. Um, and this is, you know, just to show that we are, um, we are, we have a developed IP framework, uh, national framework. Um, however, China is, you know, um, to be fair, is, is working on improving its IP protection system. Um, I think with this focus on science, innovation, growth, they are really trying to establish and institutionalize their own IP framework. And even the World Intellectual Property Organization has acknowledged the progress uh, they have made over the past years. So, um, well, again, this is a consideration, but for now, um, not an issue because um, rest assured that our s and leaders and, and science diplomats are practicing uh, due di diligence, ensuring that we protect the IP rights of our researchers and scientists. All right, uh, thank you, Kay. One more question. Um, what are the prospects for learning from China on using agriculture and technology in poverty alleviation efforts in the Philippines through FDI? Um, yes. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Um, sorry. Thank you, Ms. Teresa. Um, okay, so um, poverty alleviation is also close to my heart um, because you can see the difference between how um, millions of rural people in China were lifted out of poverty um, in, in, in its decades of development, of rapid growth and development. Um, of course, agricultural productivity is one of China is one of the Philippines benchmark. Um, they have really advanced um, agricultural um, mechanization program and reforms in the agricultural sector. Um, of course, there are still challenges um, of, um, of some of the rural folks being left behind, but um, the, at the rate of um, China's progress and its contribution to, to um, contributing to food security of uh, the global population of exporting its, its agricultural products to the world, um, there are many things to learn with its strategies and um, programs. So I hope through the scientific cooperation that we have, what's promising, I think for me, um, it's not part of the current cooperation agreements, but when we talk about smart agriculture or nanotechnologies and um, green technologies for sustainable agricultural production, those are um, really promising um, areas of cooperation that the Philippines can explore with China. Um, we have so much to learn, as well as the Chinese, they have um, um, so much to learn from the Philippines because of our different contexts and local conditions. So um, it's a promising um, field of endeavor for scientific cooperation in the future. All right, thank you, Kay. If you do have more questions to Kay, um, just send it on our chat box or you could, again, raise your hand for this one. All right, so um, maybe we could go to the... Uh, Professor Velasco, Dr. Velasco. So uh, with your presentation, I have noticed like, uh, or maybe you do have numbers as well. Like I think the Philippine students, the number of Philippine students studying in China is actually we are a little bit lagging behind than some of our ASEAN neighbors. And also I think compared to other countries as well, I think the, the number of students, of uh, Filipino students going to China is actually not that big. So what do you think is the factor of the, uh, what's the main factor or main reason if you do have um, knowledge on this one and uh, what's the main challenge maybe for the Chinese government in attracting uh, Filipino students to China as well? Um, okay, so I think based on what I have shown earlier, I think there is this still um, interest for taking or there's still or there is still a higher people still attribute higher values and sad to say people still um, attribute higher values if you get a degree say for example in um, the US or the UK as compared to other um, countries so you know the the the, the consideration of um, value of prestige of your degree is one considerable factor um, but then again as I have argued in my work um, you know China is starting to become one of the competitive um, player in the higher education landscape and they actually have um outnumbered um um scientific publication quantity um 
um, as compared to the U.S. So it means that they're trying to um, position themselves as a competitor in the higher education landscape. But then again, um, there are also affective factors why some people think that or some why um, people do not necessarily um, or are not inclined to consider China as a possible um, uh, uh, station for taking their um, further education. Um, it's because one perhaps is the language difference or um, the inability to communicate in that in, in the particular in, in China. Um, and um, that's the second reason. But then again, I think there are also English taught programs or English programs in, in China. So I think that's one way to bridge this particular gap. All right. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, huh. All right. So we do have uh, several more questions on the chat box. Maybe we could go to Jelly first. So question is, uh, uh, are Chin Noise a label just confined to Chinese who traced their ancestry to the Chinese who migrated to the Philippines during the Spanish times? What about the Chinese whose ancestors arrived during the American times and those whose parents ca came here during the China Civil War or who were stranded after China was lost to the communists or lib liberated, depending on one's point of view? Uh, thank you. That, I think that's from Ken. Yeah. Ken Benedito. Actually, the term Chinoy is a relatively new term. Mam uh, Tessi is here. Uh, she can correct me if I'm wrong. But the term Chinoy was only used uh, and popularized in the, in the 1980s. Kung tama yung pagkakaalala ko. And it was actually the kaisa para sa kaundaran uh, that uh, uh, popularized the term Chinoy, which is basically, it, it means uh, Chinong Filipino, uh, Chinong Pinoy. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, during the, the Spanish colonial period, there were terms uh, that the Spaniards used to refer to the Chinese. The most uh, 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 common was, of course, Chinos. And then before the 19th century, it was Sanglies or Sanglei. And then for the Cantonese, they usually called them uh, Macanistas or Macaus. Uh, when the Americans came, came in, uh, in 1898, uh, they used the term, of course, Chinese. They used the term China man or China men. Uh, and then, of course, you, you also have the mestizos, the Chinese mestizos. Or in the Spanish colonial period, they were called uh, mestizos de sangre or Chinos mestizos, meaning they were offspring of, of, of uh, Chinese fathers and uh, Filipino mothers. So uh, the term Chinoy was a recent uh, uh, construction, if I may use that term. So there were other other terms uh, like Pinsino. There was there was even this Pinsino Pinoy na Chino. But now it's it, the term Chino is more popular. I mean it's it's usually used uh, to refer to uh, the Chinese, the ethnic Chinese in the Philippines who trace their ancestry you know, sa, sa Chinese. Sa, sa, sa Chinese yeah. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you for that clarification, Jelly. All right, uh, maybe we go back to uh, to Joseph uh, before we go to Kay. So this um, follow up questions on your explanation earlier. One of the uh, one of our uh, yeah audience says that in his research in BRI in ASEAN, the level of financial support from China to Brunei pales significantly compared to the other ASEAN countries. Is there any reason why this is also reflected on their participation in academic opportunities in China? Um, I think we have to look at the bigger picture as well. Um, I, and as I've said earlier, I think um, these scholarships or you know, using education as soft power is not solely um, a Chinese strategy. All countries, or actually a lot of developing countries, are using um, you know, the strategy of education. Say, for example, you have the U.S. Fulbright Scholarship. You have the um, uh, you have the Fulbright. You have the Chevening Scholarship. So you know, these types of scholarships are actually um, competing against each other. So you know, one possibility is that there are other options um, for applying for. Um, 
scholarships in taking graduate studies abroad. And, you know, contextualizing it the bigger picture, we still have, and sad to say, we still have, we, va- we still value or give um, more value if you finish your degree in the West as compared to, you know, Asian, you know, Asian countries. And that's one of the reasons why um, um, at the end of the day, people will still, or people are still inclined to consider um, Western universities than Asian universities because of that value judgment that we attribute to that the degree that you complete when you finish your um, studies. Um, so that's one reason. Mm-hmm. This may be your answer also partly uh, answer already. One of the next question is like, does China have a strategy towards ASEAN using education and student as projection of its soft power? But uh, do you have anything to add on it? Or? Um, um, I think it's it's very important we also consider the, the totality of their strategy in terms of education. Um, one of the most significant and I think standard consideration of their soft power projection in terms of, edu- in terms of education is the Confucius Institutes. And I think um, in recent, or at least in the past five years, there has been this issue uh, about leveraging, or this, there, there has been issues with why or, or or at least accusations that Confucius Institutes are being used by the Chinese government to conduct, um, I don't know, es- um, issues related to espionage. But then again, um, um, I think we have to um, consider it and weigh the pros, uh, weigh the weigh the issue carefully. So that's one thing, the Confucius Institute, and it's one of their projections in terms of soft power in in terms of education. Second, we also have. Um, Chinese university. So as we, as I have noted in, or I think I failed to mention in my presentation, in the past decade, um, in Asia, the top Chinese or the top universities, um, in the region is actually between Singapore and China, which is Singapore's NUS or NTU, and then you have China's Tsinghua University. So it's a competition between um these institutions, and China is actually pouring so much money to their top universities so that um they can maintain their um standing in the region and that's you know the prestige of being on the, being admitted to a top university in the region is actually um a form of you know um a soft power mm-hmm. all right thank you joseph uh there's a direct message question sent to me for k uh the question is aside from agriculture what other industry or fields of science that china has collaborated and shared resources to the philippines do we have this aggregated data? How much support are we getting from China? So hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Mark uh, Amor. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a comprehensive disagree- uh, disaggregated data of partnership gains or outputs uh, right now with me from other sectors or fields since I focus on the agriculture, um, which is in the agriculture sector, it's quite well documented because of the previous um, development assistance provided by China on Philippine agriculture, we have hybrid rice, um, development of quality seeds, irrigation facilities and equipments, etc. Um, our scientific partnerships are decentralized as well. I mean, each national line agency have uh, or performs R and D functions, um, although DOST leads and directs uh, those uh, those initiatives. So I'm certain that there are available data on that. Um, thank you for mentioning it. Uh, because I think I can explore and use that as a reference as well. I'd be happy to share it with you once I looked into into that. So I think the direction and priorities of the active um, or ongoing SNT cooperation agreements, we can benefit from, again, on renewable energy, health, and agriculture. Some of the anticipated outputs of this ongoing research, uh, research initiatives are on Um, intervention strategies on emerging diseases such as avian flu. Um, One is developing technologies uh, such as um, what you call this exosome um, chips used in diagnosing autoimmune diseases, Um, geospatial technologies. um, So those are just some of the expected gains from the partnership, from the current collaboration. And I am also uh, pleased to share with you that in this R&D initiatives, both parties pledge counterpart funds. It's uh, we are well um, moving beyond the donor donee relationship and um, actually putting a stake on this um, partnerships. So um, it's sort of a win win situation and both can can really learn and and gain from one another. That, that's really very good to know, Kay. Uh, one more question, Kay. Uh, what do you think about the perspective that more dialogue among scientists, especially marine scientists, 
this could lead to cooperation in managing the commons like protected marine areas, thereby depoliticizing marine domains, maritime yes. domains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think we've discussed this in some of our classes with Dr. Clemente on the emerging value on discussing on the blue economy between the Philippines and China. Um, it's it's it there there has been discussions, but because of the um, the the challenging issue of the West Philippine Sea, um, joint exploration activities and such are still under you know negotiations and being discussed. Um, for the scientific community, I I, um, I hope you know all of us are open minded to it um, because um, research and development endeavors, um, as long as we aim it towards contributing to um, to sustainable managing of marine resources, uh, um, will hopefully work for both the Philippines and China. Um, in fact, uh, we learn a lot of technologies from China because of their advanced marine and aquatic um, um, sectors and industries. So um, hopefully um, this can be explored um, and um, our diplomats and our um, technocrats can facilitate that um, in the future. Thank you, Kay. Mm, all right, a uh, few more questions uh, for Dr. Velasco. Um, okay, I'm not sure if this is within the purview of your research, but I'm interested in ASEAN or Filipino students' experience of racism in China. Can you talk about this? Um, what a very interesting question. So maybe I can share with everyone because um, I'm currently a graduate student in Macau. So um, maybe I could share um, a bit of experience. Um, and I think, but, but of course, the, the, the dynamics being in Macau and being in the mainland are to, totally are extremely different experiences um, because I think Hong Kong and Macau are uh, more open and more um, internationalized. Um, so I think the issue of racism isn't or isn't that much um, because, you know, I can somewhat, you know, speak the language in a way. So I still feel that I, I can, um, um, I don't feel that, kind of races I don't feel that issue um, particularly in in my experience but I could um, I have to note that you know speaking the language is a very important um, consideration because you know as as Filipinos you know our default is when we go to other countries is that we speak in English you know we impose our um, our knowledge of how it should be but then again when you go to countries or non-anglosphere countries you know we, we cannot necessarily impose these types of behavior that oh you automatically speak in English and the other person would automatically respond to you in the language that you prefer. Um, th that does not work well in at least in this experience. So I think one of the re one of the important aspects um, when you go to these non-anglosphere countries is you at least learn the language or at least learn enough for you to be able to convey um, what you need. And that would actually um, bridge a lot of um, um, of the discrepancies, but also there is an issue between you know if you speak um, Putonghua in Cantonese, you know I'm not a speaker of um, Cantonese, but then again if you um, speak uh, if you speak at least in the in in this part of China, um, I have to say that there is some discontent or disagreement when it comes to um, imposing your um, imposing Mandarin as the language that is um, right um, that is. Um, quote unquote accepted by the majority of the population. But then again, there are some pockets of society that do not necessarily feel greatly about being imposed um, the this particular language when you um deal with them. So I think that's a very important aspect when considering um graduate studies in this part of the world is that at least you have to have a sense of the language um, and do not impose your English um requirement or your Anglosphere uh ideas in this part of the world mm -hmm. i agree with that with joseph uh, joseph by the way aside from of, of course the language problem what do you think uh, as a student in as a, a student who experienced the life in china what are the other main challenge as a filipino or are there are mm. really like maybe difficulties that uh, because these are the always fear of students going to abroad are well, you? actually, I've met a lot of Filipino students here as well. Um, and as I've said, the, one of the major issues is language, because if you are mm -hmm. not, if you cannot speak the language, you know, it's so difficult to take part in these activities, which are, um, which are in, um, prepared by the institution or the government or the um, uh, of the SAR itself. Um, 
But aside from that, I think one of the most significant consideration is the zero COVID policy of um, China. Um, and, you know, like other parts of the world are opening up, but for us um, in this part of the world, it is still quite difficult and it is still restri- highly restrictive in terms of going in and out of um, the borders. So that's another um, aspect to think about. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think this is the main challenge nowadays for um, all students going abroad, like the COVID policies are very strict and it sometimes it depends on the kind of scholarship that you're getting as well. I think it's more lenient if you have government scholarship because it's government to government. But anyway, uh, uh, as one of the benefactors as well of many exchange programs to China, as a Filipino student uh, going to China, I think if, if I may add, I think it's, uh, for me, it's a little bit easy to go to East Asian countries. I mean, the language is the challenge there but aside from that filipinos could blend easily to the chinese to korean or the other asian countries i mean unlike if you go to the western countries i mean you will stand out i mean they will know that you are not local but if you are a filipino in chinese in china i mean they will not care actually a lot more about you because you blend with it unless of course, if, once you speak, they will not. It's that you're not Chinese because you cannot speak the language. So I, that's why um, learning the language is one of the tools. I mean, this, you don't need to. It's very difficult, of course, to master the Chinese language. But for everyday living, it's actually very important. So, But I think for Filipino students, I mean, don't worry so much. I mean, you will learn a lot from your experience going to, the, uh, to China. And yeah, I mean... Mm, you could blend easily. <laughs> you could pretend as a Chinese if you don't want to get more so much. But yeah, it, it's 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 you could do it. <laughs> anyway, actually, you're right. Um, yeah. um, like when you um start talking, that's when they notice that you're not necessarily um from there. And then when you when they notice the tones that you speak, um, yeah, that's where they start noticing. Hmm, he he's not from here. Yeah. And yeah, actually, if you go to big cities like Beijing, uh, there are mm, Shanghai, maybe if you study this big, the big universities, top universities were in this big city. So there are, yeah, Macau as well. Yeah, of course, Hong Kong, they are uh, for tourists, uh, for foreigners, they are used to it. So yeah, they try to at least adjust themselves if they notice that they cannot speak the language I mean, for everyday living. All right. So those are interesting things. I and mean, this is how do you learn and how? Uh, China, how you learn other countries, you need to immerse yourself so that you could get that um, cultural quotient, cultural intelligence. <laughs> anyway, all right, Mark, Jelly, the questions, are there any reports that, sa- that some or a number of Chinese criminals during the Spanish period were deported or sent to Mindanao? Mm. And in relation to that, what is the original trait or deliberate choice that, uh, that the Cantonese ended up as the cooks, laundry people, bakers, or artisans. Yeah, okay. thank you, Mike, for the question. Actually, Mindanao, Mindanao was the favorite uh, place for uh, deporting uh, China, undesirable Chinese, not necessarily criminals. So, uh, Mindanao and Cebu. So those Chinese who were who committed uh, uh, criminal acts in in the zone would be uh, transported or exiled to Mindanao. Or holo, holo uh, suli. Uh, there were a lot of materials that you can use, uh, especially the deportados bundles in the National Archives of the Philippines. We have hundreds of deportados uh, documents, so you can check the uh, the bundles on uh, Sulu and Mindanao for those uh, individuals not necessarily Chinese, but perhaps you can. Uh, uh, check if there were, I'm, I'm sure there were a lot of Chinese uh, offenders who, uh, who were deported to Sulu and Mindanao. One example would be uh, uh, a, a group of Chinese in Binondo who were not able to pay their taxes in 1851-1852. So uh, the Spanish colonial government wanted them to pay their taxes, but they could not pay their taxes, so they were sent to they were exiled to, to Mindanao, particularly in Polok, Polok, uh, Cotabato. Because during that time, 1851, 1852, the Spanish colonial government were able to occupy that part of Mindanao. So the idea was this uh, deportees, these exiles, would 
be instrumental in populating the newly acquired territory and they would be uh, instrumental in in the cultivation of, of the land and also in building uh, military uh, installations so you, you, there's a lot of materials that you can especially during the second half of the 19th century aside from the chinos bundles you can check particularly the, the, the deportados bundles at the national Archives of the philippines how about the original trade? Uh, how did they end up like cooks, laundry people, bakers, or artisans? Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if it was a regional trait or a deliberate uh, choice. Mm -hmm. uh, based on the materials I have gathered thus far, uh, it, they, 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 they highlight the fact that it's because the because of the the, the cabecillas or the, uh, the the merchants, particularly the merchants who already uh, in the Philippines during, during that time, had already established businesses. Mm -hmm. So the the tendency would be the new uh, Cantonese immigrants would be employed by these uh, uh, merchants. So I'm not sure. Uh, perhaps I, maybe it's a deliberate choice, depending on the availability of opportunities economic opportunities although it doesn't it, just, it doesn't necessarily mean that only uh, Cantonese mm -hmm. were uh, cooks or, or they were they, the Cantonese were only the lonely people or bakers and artisans they were also Hokkien cooks they were Hokkien bakers but based on the materials uh, the best quote unquote, the best or the more preferred uh, cooks for instance were Cantonese but they were also uh, Hokkien, Hokkien uh, cooks and artisans and others. Oh, with that note, I remember like I mean, the Chinese within the Philippines are actually very much influenced by the Cantonese style. So I, I, maybe, maybe I'm wrong or not with that. But anyway, Jelly, there's another one. Uh, this is a very interesting question that I would like to know as well. Could you give a characterization on how Chinos and Macanista were treated by the colonial government? and by the locals themselves. Is there a difference in the way Chinos and Macanista are perceived? Uh, during the Spanish colonial period, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, the, 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 the Spanish colonial authorities did not make any distinction between the, the Macanistas and the, and the Chinos or the Hokkien. You know? For them, what's important is they're all Chinese and they had to pay their taxes. So we can only determine their, whether they, this Chinese is uh, Hokkien or uh, Cantonese depending on the, what they put in their uh, passports or in the padrones. You know? uh, interestingly, it was the journalist, Spanish journalist and other foreign travelers who made uh, distinctions between the the, 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 the chinos and the, the cantonese for instance like what i mentioned uh for uh, for comench he's a investigative journalist in the 19th century he mentioned that there was a, a subtle animosity between the between the hokkien and the, the, the chinos and the macanistas like Ayaw ng mga makanistas na silang chinos and the chinos did not want to be called makanistas. That's, that's one. Although for Edgar Wickberg, the classic work of uh, Edgar Wickberg's Chinese in Philippine Life, states that uh, there might be some uh, subtle animosities, but uh, there, wa there were no violent confrontations no, between these two groups, at least in, in, in the context of Manila during that time. Um, the, the Macaus, the Macanistas, uh, had a had a better view of themselves. Like they had high regard of themselves because they came from Macau and, and the language was Portuguese. So and Portuguese was uh, related to the Spanish. So the Macaus were more uh, they could understand Spanish better than the Chinos or the Hokkien. So for the for the Macaus, uh, mas magaling kami kasi sa mga sa mga Chinos. So. Uh, is there a difference in the way Chinos and Macanistas are perceived? Uh, well, from the point of view of the Spaniards, voila, they're all Chinese. Mm -hmm. They have to pay the, the taxes, have to follow the policies 
for the for the uh, foreign observers, foreign travelers like Jean Mala, the French Jean Mala, Jean Boring, etc. Uh, it appears, based on my reading, it appears that these foreigners had high, uh, better uh, better regard of, of the Bacanistas than the, the, the Chinos. Right. Uh, but from the from the Spanish point of view, they're all Chinese. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that, Jelly. I think um, it's very good. Like, um, if you're doing comparative studies right now, um, refer also to the history of this uh, Chinese in the Philippines. Uh, all right, uh, Joseph. Uh, since you have mentioned China's zero COVID policy, so do you foresee a decline in China's people to people exchanges and mobility of the international community in the field of scholarships and academic fellowships this coming period of pandemic recovery? Um, yeah, that's a very um, difficult thing to uh, predict because I think China at this moment is still holding on to its zero COVID strategy. And during at the uh, I think and at the height of the pandemic, there were actually students who were or international students who were admitted to universities in China who were not necessarily able to um, go to the institution um, themselves. So what happened was they conducted their studies remotely. And some of them are actually almost about to finish their degrees without having stepped on campus, which, which is, I think, a common experience for yeah. um, the big part of the world. Um, but then again, since, as I've said, like um, the for the most part, the world is starting to open up. Um, some restrictions have been lifted. Border regulations have been um, loosened. But for in the case of China, that's not necessarily the case. Um, they are still imposing... Um, long quarantines and admission to the country is on a case-to-case -case basis. Um, and that would actually have, or I, I would predict that it would have an impact on the way um, or the, tra the trajectory of people-to-people -people exchange between um, China and the rest of the world because of this um, strategy. And I think um, in the case of the Philippines and China, um, that would actually have an effect of, for those students who wish to continue or who wish to proceed to China for further studies because they will not necessarily be able to enter the country and they will only finish their degree online. And I, I think that would be... Um, that would be the that, that is not the ideal experience. And if you compare, if you wish to get um, degrees from other countries where you can fly in freely, then of course uh, the more rational choice is for you to do that instead of doing the remote learning um, in this particular setup. So that would be um, a difficult thing to manage in the future. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think um, Ambassador Wang Xilian mentioned also earlier that they will make an assessment on how will they move forward on this pandemic. So I think we should uh, look at the announcement later on of the Chinese embassy in Manila, or even the press releases of the Chinese government on how will they move forward on this one. Because I think uh, this is a common problem with uh, not only in China, but in many other countries, that there are a lot of restrictions, even for a student, uh, even student visas are not even provided, not, I mean, not only China. So uh, yeah. Uh, we will see well, what will happen next and we will observe what will happen next. All right. So uh, we do have very productive morning. We have 10 minutes left uh, for this. And then, of course, later on, we will do have another panel that, um, that, that you should check on this one. And, uh, of course, to gain more insights, the title of our panel later on is In Regional Comparisons and Dynamics in Development, politics and security you can check our facebook page for the program and our website as well all right anyway so before we close this maybe we could ask uh, the three presenters um, maybe some um, final words or to wrap up any advice or anything that you want to add into as well on uh, on what you have presented earlier or, or in the questions that you have answered okay maybe we could start on k mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Ms. Ivy. Um, I've I've always said this in in my classes during um during our classes at, at Asian Center that China is um, really an exciting area of study uh, because of um, because of the many changes that is happening in its society and um, its 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 role in the in the international community. So for um, Chinese scholars like myself. Um, um, these um, 
keep engaging with your, your fellow colleagues or your colleagues and um, your, your professors who would guide you and um, really um, open your, your, your minds and thoughts to, you know, almost all aspects about China. It's, it, it's such an exciting area of study and I hope more students will get to discover um, China. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kay. Uh, Dr. Jelly? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the, my paper here. Uh, maraming salamat sa lahat. I think um, the history of the Chinese in the Philippines, although a lot has been written by Mam Tessie, um, uh, Sir Richard Chu, Caroline Howe, and others, there's still a lot of materials to uncover. There's still a lot of materials to read, to organize, and to to, to write about. So I encourage everyone, especially the graduate students who are here this in, in our, uh, our session, I encourage everyone to, uh, to help us and to help us in, in, in going back to, to, to our past and, and uh, getting more materials for, for, uh, for, the, for the writing uh, uh, about the history of the Chinese in the Philippines and also historical and cultural relations between the Philippines and China in the earlier, in the earlier periods. Not just the contemporary, but balik tayo ng context to give us a better view of what is happening at, uh, right now. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shelly. Dr. Joseph? Um, so um, just to uh, first and foremost, I want to acknowledge and thank the officers and the committees in charge for um, of, of PACS for holding this event. And I think just to add to um, what I have said earlier, um, I think um, Chinese you know, education is starting to become um, a significant factor in the region. And I hope that we take this, um, we take the opportunities that are available so that we could uh, um, further um, develop our human resources and um, our skills in this particular area. And most of all, I think we have to reconsider the way we see um, education and the value judgment that we attribute to it. And we hope that um, we see that uh, we, we reconsider the change, we consider the change in the region as well as um, explore other avenues for learning about China and the Chinese and other tangential um, topics. All right. So thank you to our presenters. So to our audience this morning, thank you very much. As you know, there are a lot of areas and aspects that we could explore and um, study more about China. There are a lot of areas and opportunities. We always use or uh, think about Philippines-China relations, about security, about conflict. But when conflict overlaps, there are if conflict overlaps, opportunities actually overlap as well. So there are a lot of rooms cooperation. China is just our neighbor. It's very close to us. Uh, we need to maximize and get that opportunity uh, to study about China, of course, in order for us to improve the Philippines as well and our relations with China. So me moving on that as as much as we want to talk to you more about this one and to our speakers, we need to have a break and have your lunch. We will continue our next panel. Uh, we need to close this Zoom session and we will start at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, right? Yeah, 2 p.m. And yes, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. We have three more speakers. Uh, yeah, it's on regional comparisons and dynamics in development, politics, and security. So, and then we do have this session every Saturday as well. You could check PAX website, pax.ph, and of course, our Facebook page, Twitter page for more updates. So again, thank you very much to our three presenters, to our audience, and uh, we hope to see you this afternoon for more um, um, engagements with you and talk with you about, about Philippine-China relations. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you later. Have a good lunch.